This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here and welcome back to our ethics video series. This video will be all about non-maleficence. So non-maleficence is the second principle of ethics that we'll discuss and it's also referred to as the do no harm principle. This principle expresses the concept that professionals have a duty to protect the patient from harm. So the first code of professional conduct is pretty simple. You need to keep your knowledge and your skill current and updated. With continuing education, regular training, and reading of new data in peer-reviewed journals. And the professional privilege of dentists rests primarily in the knowledge and skill with which we serve patients and society. Therefore, we have an obligation to keep our knowledge and skills current. Consultation and referral. I talk about this in our other series on the channel, but one of my favorite sayings is when in doubt, refer it out. And if we attempt to take out a bony impacted wisdom tooth when we don't have the specialized experience to do so, we risk harming the patient. So under the principle of non-maleficence, we should refer the patient to someone with specialized training when we need help so that we do no harm to them. And when referring, be as specific as possible about the problem and then trust the specialist to determine the appropriate treatment. Along with this, the specialist or consulting dentist must return the patient to you for continued care once specialized treatment has been completed, and then they would also let the patient know if any other treatment needs still remain. The second half of this code is connected to our first advisory opinion of non-maleficence. Sometimes a patient seeks a second opinion from another dentist or specialist concerning a diagnosis or a treatment plan. Maybe they're just not sure about what that first dentist told them. And the advisory opinion states that a dentist rendering or giving that second opinion should not have a vested interest, that means a personal stake with promise of financial gain, in the ensuing or subsequent recommendation. In other words, if a patient comes to you for a second opinion, you shouldn't tell them exactly what they want to hear just to get them to pay you instead of the other dentist. For example, if a patient wants veneers on all of their healthy teeth just because they want them to look a little whiter, you shouldn't say, yeah, I'll do that for you, no problem, because that would be unethical. Instead, you should have a proper informed consent conversation with them from our previous video on autonomy and recommend tooth whitening as a conservative first option before you jump to cutting a whole bunch of healthy tooth structure just to make teeth look a little bit whiter. So use of auxiliary personnel. We are ethically obligated to assign tasks to team members only what they can legally perform. In other words, you're not going to tell your dental assistant to pick up a handpiece and start drilling a cavity preparation for you. Another example, dental hygienists can administer local anesthesia in some states, but not in others. So you'd need to be familiar with the credentials of each staff member and the rules of the jurisdiction in which you are practicing. And of course, all care should be supervised by a dentist to ensure that no one is inflicting harm to a patient. The ultimate responsibility falls to the dentist. Personal impairment. So it's unethical to practice under the influence of alcohol, a controlled substance, or any other chemical agent that would impair your ability to practice safely. The advisory opinion expands on this and says that any condition that might impair your ability to practice, even a communicable disease that might endanger patients or dental staff, should result in appropriate limitations in what you do in that practice. It's also ethical to encourage a chemically impaired dental colleague to pursue treatment if there is an addiction or dependency issue. And it's also ethical to report a colleague who is practicing dentistry while impaired. If you're unsure 
If an employee is abusing a drug and it's only a suspicion, you should do a randomized drug test on all your employees to determine that for certain before reporting that individual. Post-exposure for bloodborne pathogens. So we also have an ethical obligation to immediately tell the patient if they've been exposed to blood or another potentially infectious material. If the dentist accidentally nicked their finger with a dental instrument and there was some blood contamination, even if the dentist has no bloodborne diseases, they need to tell the patient and refer them to get a post-exposure evaluation, which usually involves some blood work and maybe some prophylactic medication, depending on who the blood came from. Along with that, you should submit yourself to testing if you're the source individual or encourage a staff member to get testing if they are the source to assist the patient in their evaluation, again, to avoid doing harm to them. You would also want to refer that patient for a follow-up evaluation to make sure that everything is okay. Patient abandonment. This one is really, really important and comes up on the board exam all the time. So once you begin a course of treatment for a patient, that means fabricating a complete denture, putting braces on, filling all their cavities, you must not stop in the middle of that treatment plan unless you give them adequate notice that you desire to terminate your relationship and give them adequate opportunity to obtain the services of another dentist. In other words, if you as the dentist unilaterally decide to end your relationship with this patient without giving them time to find another dentist, you would be violating the principle of non-maleficence. And that's because their oral health could be in jeopardy without having a dentist to fulfill their treatment needs. In case you're wondering, there is a right way to dismiss a patient, which would involve sending them a written letter containing the reasons why the dentist-patient relationship is being terminated. That could be they were uncooperative with the dentist's instructions, they consistently didn't show up to appointments, they didn't pay for their procedures, and giving them adequate time, at least 30 days, to find a new dentist in their area. All right, the last one. Dentists should avoid interpersonal relationships that could impair their professional judgment or risk the vulnerability of a patient. In other words, romantic interactions between dentists and patients are unethical. Note that when we're saying personal relationships, the ADA code does not prevent dentists from treating their own family members. However, it still may not be recommended, again, because judgment might be impaired. So that decision comes down to the circumstance and the dentist. So to summarize, the principle of non-maleficence includes taking continuing education courses and keeping your knowledge updated, knowing your limitations and referring when needed, having a trained and qualified staff, not drinking alcohol during work hours, informing patients about exposure incidents, never abandoning a patient mid-treatment, and not getting involved in any kind of personal relationship with our patients. That's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.